It's no exaggeration to say that the renaissance of British automata art in the late 20th century started in Falmouth. In the 1960s, Falmouth Art College at Wood Lane provided a broad foundation course. As you'd expect, some of the students stayed on in Falmouth after graduating. One of them was Sue Jackson, a young mother of three children. Sue enjoyed being part of the artistic community that lived in the Stratum Terrace Florence Place area, but she also had a restless energy. Sue Jackson went in for various enterprises and she would go in head first. I think the first thing she really got into was a play group. She ran a play group uh, and that was the finest, most energetic play group that every, all, you know, all the mums and dads wanted to get their kids into in Falmouth. Then I think it was Oscar's, the restaurant, mm -hmm. which they did up to the hilt as well. The restaurant was wildly successful. To them it was almost like having a party every night is what they used to say. And then having to do the washing up in the morning you know, and sort of start again. She and Peter, her husband, were played out there. So Sue decided to do this slightly less onerous uh, job. In 1975, she opened a shop in the high street just called Sue Jackson. She loved sort of putting different things together. So you've got an early idea of a bit of fun and feathers and Victoriana. She realised that she knew lots of people who made things. Soon the shop was full of their products. It was a cheerful and quirky place. One of Sue's suppliers was Ron Fuller. So how does Ron Fuller fit into this story? Ron Fuller was at art school with Sue Jackson. Ah. He was one of her first boyfriends. And, it's, and, and they'd all, forever afterwards, they'd had a, they would sort of get together, as it were. They used to go paddling in a, a canoe that Ron had built. Ron's work featured very simple designs, clearly drawing on Sam Smith's painted toys. They focused on the absolute essential features. Oh, oh yes, of course. It's it a is. kicking lady. Absolutely. And Ron's work's a jolly sight better than mine. We all had that toy as children because we all had pecking hens. Yes. Ron used to say, I'm a toy maker. I, you know, I, I don't do art, even though he went to the Royal College and yeah, yeah. printed yeah, things for Hockney and stuff. Of you know. Ron's toys were sold in Sue's shop. Peter Markey was another friend. He was our art teacher at school, yeah. mm. but we knew the Markeys from years back. He was an incredibly generous person, so he'd always appear with lots of bits and pieces yes, of things that he'd so made. He gave everybody in Falmouth yeah. some, you know, one of these. I mean, the amount of people who've got unicycles doesn't bear thinking about. She cajoled Peter into to bringing some things in. <laughs> Pretty soon, the mechanical things took over from the things that just sat there. It's late 78, um, she amazing. started Cabaret. That is the first location on Falmouth High and Street. Absolutely, and, and we, I remember this big harlequin there. And yes. actually the Cabaret lettering is, of course, that... The circus lettering, the yeah. Victorian circus lettering again, yeah. isn't it? So that was it. That was the marquee. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it was via Peter Markey that I sort of got 
into all this sort of thing. He'd been on the telly quite a bit because he he did these uh, wave machines and they the cameramen like it, you know. Boot of his Fiat Panda, full of things he'd made. He was he he was up all night it doing this. Too? Thought well, if if Peter can do this in his spare time, which it was uh, then, uh, I think I ought to get my finger out. Paul's constructions are often large and complex, with exquisitely crafted detail. They have been bought by collectors all round the world. So my dad had an antique shop and she basically swapped yeah. because she was getting too big yeah. because she was insisting on keeping one of everything uh, that Paul and Peter made because right. she couldn't bear to sell them yeah. and somebody said this is a museum not a shop. We would pay to go in 50p yeah. Yeah. and you'd see maybe 40 or 50 things inside which were push all button, operated yeah. by push button. There was a blank wall at the back. Yeah, yeah. And I know that she would have said to Peter Markey, oh, what can you do to fill me that wall? And, you know, on Friday and by Monday, he would have produced this sure, giant it, dragon. So. One of the things that fascinated me most was that Crafts Council listing. The Americans would go from the airport. They had a 14 day trip organized by the Crafts Council in England of which one of the things they did was to come to her museum. I mean, wow. More than 20,000 people visited Cabaret in its last year in Falmouth. Sue recognised from this footfall that Automata could be a real tourist attraction. So she petitioned Carrick Council to let her build on the end of Prince of Wales Pier. When she was refused permission, she bravely took out a lease on premises in Covent Garden, London between 1984 and 2000. Cabaret Mechanical Theatre still exists as an online business organising exhibitions around the world. Sue Jackson retired in 2013 and died in 2016, aged 77. What had made her successful? She was very um, sure of what she wanted and she was very impatient um, to, to, to see the result of a vision mm -hmm. um, and I think um, all the shops and the things that she did were a result of that and she was really good at just getting everybody to come along with her so she got Paul and Peter to drive up to London overnight and to yeah, assemble that's... everything. People wanted yeah. to make it work because she could sort of convey the enthusiasm that she visualised. Peter Markey died also in 2016, aged 86. Ron Fuller died in 2017, aged 80. Falmouth continues to be the home of a number of automatists. Paul Spooner is currently carving figures for an automaton reflecting on Brexit. Fee Henshaw and Carla Zapata live nearby and create distinctly different works in adjacent workshops. Keith Newstead has his workshop near the centre of Falmouth, where he has just completed this massive automaton based on Mervyn Peake's novel Gormenghast. He hates producing runs of the same thing, so also develops prototypes that are sent to Taiwan and converted into kits that introduce a new generation to the joys of automata. Children might need simpler kits to begin with. Very slowly the little sheep bends its head and eats the cabbage and the wolf is there with its great big teeth and you're just wondering, wondering, wondering and then as you go click, one more click. I've watched tiny wee's jump and I've watched senior citizens jump when that happens and I've watched little tiny wee's burst into tears actually as well so it's, you know, but it is um, and then want to do it again and again and again and I've watched, also watched sort of eight year old boys I stood over them where one of them was saying I'll tell you what, if you wind really fast and I put my finger in here I think we can break this <laughs> but, you know, that's also fine, you know, because they're exploring. Building simple automata can help children understand in a very concrete but fun way the principles of cogs, levers, camshafts and pulleys. Thank you. 
Thank you.